any football team, probably the best team they've had in years. And believe you me, they came to play. For as long as anyone can remember, Alabama football has been synonymous with winning. The Crimson Tide claimed its first of 12 national titles on New Year's Day in 1926, surprising Washington and the rest of the country in the Rose Bowl. They'd win four more by 1941, but championships and wins were scarce by the end of the 1950s. In that dark hour, Mama placed a call to Paul Bryant, and the golden age of Alabama football was underway. Winning national titles with the likes of Leroy Jordan, Joe Namath, and Ray Perkins in 61, 64, and 65, and another undefeated though unrewarded season in 1966 established the school as the dominant force in college football. But back in the late 50s, while the Bear was busy trying to turn things around in Tuscaloosa, a lean athletic lefty named Kenny Stabler was turning heads in Foley. Life in Foley growing up here, uh, probably typical, typical small town upbringing, small little town of, I don't know, maybe 5,000 people at that point in time. Great support, you know, great fan support, uh, great tradition, you know, sports tradition. Foley always had a great reputation for having good sports teams, athletic teams, you know. And back then, uh, Gulf Shores wasn't what, there was one place in Gulf Shores called the Hangout. I mean, it was right at the end of the tee, and that, that, was, that was all there was down there. But uh, Foley's just a nice town. Foley and Fairhope and Snake was a hero down there in high school. Everybody knew him. Fairhope was on the beach, uh, the bay, and Foley was the great whitewater down 20 miles down the road. But uh, it was just a, Baldwin County was a great place to grow up. My father was a service manager for automobile dealerships. My mom was a nurse's aide. And a younger sister, five years younger than I, Carolyn. And a typical, you know, typical small town upbringing with uh, family always, great support, getting you back and forth to practice, giving you whatever equipment you might need. Well, I remember when he was playing Little League football uh -huh. and baseball. In fact, he was on the baseball team we had uh, called was Pony League, was 13 and 14, but Ken played as, as a 12-year-old. Probably baseball was probably my first love. I mean, that's, I remember playing football, baseball and football at a real young age. I was always had the ability or God-given ability to be able to throw, to be able to throw things, whether it be a football or where you shoot a basketball or throw a rock or whatever. I, could, I had the ability to throw, you know, and have decent control doing it. I mean, his sophomore year, we had a great 61. We had a great football team, and he probably played as a sophomore. He played half of the... Uh, at least half the games, mm -hmm. you know, get in, and then actually started the last ball game of the season as a defensive back. My father had to bribe me to play football. You know, I was in, I don't know, eighth grade, ninth grade, and 
Didn't want to go out for football, didn't want to play football. I was going to be a baseball player. I wanted to pitch, and that's all I really cared about. And uh, my father, you know, said, I'll buy you a car if you it'll get you back and forth to practice if you'll go out for football. And he did. It was a 1954 Ford, a black one. A black 54 Ford was my first car. My father bought it as a, as a bribe to get me to go out for football. And uh, looking back on it, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad he did. Quickly, Stabler was gaining notoriety. His physical stature, athletic exploits across multiple sports, and engaging personality made him a larger-than-life figure. Add to that a memorable nickname. I get that question a lot. You know, you know, how did you get your nickname? You know, and it, it goes back to I don't know eighth or ninth grade playing junior varsity football here, and Coach Hollis was the coach, junior varsity coach, and. If, if memory serves, I think I'm returning punts of all things. I was a pretty good runner. I'm returning punts. And I think that I ran, you know, you go ran, run 60 yards to cover 30. Cut back, cut back, cut back, cut back. And Coach Hollis yelled out, he runs like a snake. You ran about 250 yards. I ran back and forth and cut back and cut back and cut back, you know. And Coach, he yelled, he runs like a snake. And all my pals, all my buddies on the sideline standing, picked up on it and, you know, We've been called worse. <laughs> you wake up Friday morning and you know that you're going to play that night. And that was something that you just really looked forward to. Couldn't wait to get out of school. Didn't pay attention in school. You know, you just couldn't wait to go and play. And the, the crowd, the band, the cheerleaders, the whole, you know, the field, the whole, the whole, you know, the whole scene, Friday night lights, uh, is so true in my case, you know. Good teams, win, passionate about it, the fans, great fan support. It's you know, like Friday night lights. Alabama teams of the 1960s were led by capable, at times spectacular quarterbacks. Bryant placed his offense in the hands of Pat Trammell, Joe Namath, and Steve Sloan. His search for the next great Alabama quarterback brought him to the doorstep of Slim and Sally Stabler. I remember my mom cooking for him. My mom cooked, and we had a little, little you know, little house uh, about three blocks from here. You know, not a big house, small little place on the corner down on, I think, Fig Street. I think it's Fig Street. Uh, but I remember him walking in and the same, you know, you just, you just glued to him. You just can't take your eyes off of him and you just kind of stare at this man. And I knew he had a pretty good chance. Plus their, their high school coach was a good friend of mine. And uh, Coach Bryant and the daddy got along real well. So we felt like we would get Kenny Stabler pretty good. And we sat him down at the little, little uh, dining room table and my dad always sat up on this end and I was always on this end, but we gave him the end chair and I sat over my mom and my sister and. You know, we just talked about Alabama football and, you know, what he thought about this team and that team. And we play our formation. We play a lot like we play a lot. And, you know, Kenny plays a lot like we play at Alabama. I, you know, he just saw a deep crowd, you know. Kenny Stabler was unique in the fact that he could uh, run the ball real well. He could run the options real well. And he could throw the ball excellently. And that's the kind of a quarterback you like to have to wear. If a pass rushes on, he'd pull it down and somewhere maybe get you five or ten yards, and he had that ability. He said, if you're going to go and work as hard as it takes to be able to play, then you need to win. If you're going to work that hard and be that committed, then it's important that you win. And the more I thought about that, went to Auburn. They played like I did with Jimmy Seidel. They played the same type of offense we did at Auburn. And this player that I really liked, Jimmy Seidel, I played like him. It almost went to Auburn until, you know, the whole thing about winning came up. I want to point this out to you. You're not ordinary. You're not average. You're something special. We don't want you to ever forget that. And since you are something special, then I know that you can win if you put a little extra into it every day a little extra into it in the game. Even after I signed with Alabama and went, went, to, went to school there, you know, playing for Coach Brown up there, always just in awe of him, you know. When he would walk in, when he would walk in the locker room or walk in the dorm where we lived, I mean, I just, I, I just stared at him, you know. I just stared at him and watched him 
watched him walk through the room and hung on every word that he said, you know, which was not a lot, not a lot, you know, he wasn't a, you know, he'd say a few things, and but it, it all, it all usually made an awful lot of sense, and he had a great way of taking a few words and putting things in perspective of what this is worth and what it's going to cost you and this and that and all of that. Like I was telling you this afternoon, I'm not trying to say I told you so, but like I've been trying to tell you what I can always tell you, and which any coach would do, that 10 minutes after the game is too late. The next day is too late. So, best thing we can do, of course, is to use this as a stepping stone. But if you've got class, it'll work out. It'll work out. I'll tell you one thing about Coach Bryant. He probably had more influence on myself and every player that ever played for him because of his ability not only to teach the game football, but he, he taught a lot of life situations. And I, there's hardly a, a day goes by that something doesn't happen that reminds me of things that Coach Bryant taught us. To us at that point in time, he was probably 240, 250, 6'4". You know, he was a big man. Talked from the bottom of his shoes and that deep, deep voice and smoking those Chesterfields. They were non-filtered. He'd get tobacco on his lip and he would he spit that tobacco like that when he was talking to you, and he just had that piercing look right through you look, you know, and, and a big man, you know, like I said, 6'4", 250, and that real deep, you know, growl he had, you know, I just, you know, all of him. I just admired him so much and just said, boy, what a man. Let's put our rush on. Let's put both of our rushes on every once in a while. And don't wait, don't wait till they're backed up. Put them on and throw them for some losses. Do it. Actually, the only thing they're doing, really, we're going to pass uh, 50 passes on first down. Now, another way that we can get Holman uncovered, and they're doubling hold most of the time, we want to go to the other man. Another way we can get him uncovered is by a tackle over. Coach Brown always stressed the little things, you know. He said, don't try to go outside your ability and do things. Just do the little things and do them great. And, and that's what he stressed. I mean, we weren't a lot of great football players at Alabama. There weren't a lot of great ones down there. But he made believers out of everybody that was there. He said, you know, just stick with my plan. Do what I tell you to do. And uh, we'll be winners. This just makes it perfect. This just makes it perfect. We're behind. They're all fired up. We got class. We're going to find it out. We got class, and I know we got it. And what we got to do, first place, our defense has got to go out there and take the ball. Our defense <laughs> hasn't been taking the ball. We got to take the ball, otherwise we're not going to get it enough. We got to get reckless on defense. We just can't stand there and wait for them catching passes and then tackling them. Then when we get the ball, we got to have 11 people. 11 people that's just going to do their job, whatever it is. Just going to do their job and try to score every time you get the football. If we do that, we'll be all right. If we do that, we'll be all right. Coach Bryant was a motivator. Don't ever think he, his best talent was he could get people that weren't very good or, or were just average like me or, or other players, put them with somebody like Kenny Stabler or Mike Hall, great players, and we molded as a team and he could get, you know, get us to do so much more together as a team than any other coach I'm aware of. He just brought that confidence out in a player. You know, when he would say something to that player, that player believed it. That player wanted to please Coach Bryant. He, he wanted to hear Coach Bryant say, Good job, nice play, good rush, good drop, good coverage. Wouldn't be much, but, you know, we just coveted hearing Coach Bryant say something positive about, and, and that was one of the great characteristics that he had, is that everybody wanted to please him. Pleasing Bryant required effort, sacrifice, and a measure of God-given talent from those who'd lead his units on the field. With two years as an understudy behind him, Stabler was ready to guide the Crimson Tide offense. I had the opportunity of playing with uh, uh, my sophomore year. Joe Namath was a quarterback. My, my uh, junior year, Steve Sloan was a quarterback. And then, of course, my senior year, uh, Snake. And, and all of them were different personalities. Uh, Sloan was a lot more quieter. He, he kind of led by example. Uh, Joe had to, he just led because of just pure ability. I mean, he could just, he could beat you throwing the ball. Kenny, Kenny was kind of a fun loving guy. He was kind of a jokester and, uh, and, and, and had a good time. And when he was on the field, he was, he was dead serious. It was all about winning. 
It's all about winning. And now you're up here with this great school, with all this great tradition and national championships, and uh, Trammell and Namath and Bobby Jackson and Harry Gilmer, Bart Starr. You know, all those names start popping up, you know, and you just, here I am, right in the middle of that very thing, you know. My, my turn, my opportunity. That was probably the first thought. Bryant Hall was just a gorgeous place to live at that point in time, you know, when you could have the athletic dorms that were just for the athletes at the university. And it's just a gorgeous place with red rugs everywhere and national championship trophies here and pictures of great players here. And now you're living there, you know. So it's just, you know, I'm almost like, you know, you're, you're living a dream, as they say, you know, and you're just right in the middle of it, a small-town kid from Foley, Alabama. If I can, anybody can. He was a very young well-balanced youngster and football to him was everything and he was a very disciplined young man on the field coach brown always said about he and namath and others don't mess with the quarterbacks because they've got their initial ability and we don't need to change it that much he was an excellent football player and snake uh, to me it probably had the greatest uh, ability on the field to to know what to call in fact i remember one game against Ole Miss that Coach Brown had sent in a play and, and, and Snake in the hole, he said, that's not going to work. And he called another play and scored a touchdown. And we came off the field, Coach Brown jerked him over there. He said, you better be glad that worked. He brought to the table a, a confidence and he, uh, he, was, he was cool. I mean, you could hold a 12-gauge shotgun and point it at him and he'd never budge. I think people are born with that. He was a field general. Uh, he didn't put up with any uh, nonsense in the huddle. Of course, there wasn't a whole lot of nonsense going on in the huddle. Uh, but uh, uh, you could talk to him uh, if you felt like you could block your man or uh, had an edge on him. You could come back to the huddle and, and ask him to run a play, and uh, he'll call it. And if it works, he'll call it again. But uh, he, was, uh, he was definitely in command of that huddle. I wouldn't say he was a speed demon, but he was very uh, mobile. He could, could move. Uh, you know, he could run an option. He could do the rollout. If he rolled out, he's left-handed. If he rolled out, either way, he was accurate. He had to have all that ability, and he had a just an unbelievable soft touch on the football, could throw it long or short, or in the flat, or any, you know, any kind of throw, he could make it. He was, he was our leader. He was our rallying point. We, we just didn't, like I said earlier, that was the mentality that we had when we were here, that nobody could beat us. We j just, nobody could beat us. With a strong side to the left, Roman is wide, man in motion to the right. Graber takes, high out pass, rock breaking hit. He's throwing long to Dennis Roman. Roman is taking it in a great play. I don't remember thinking that I could do it better than everybody else, but I'll, I do remember thinking that, 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 that this comes easy to me. It does. Basketball, football, all of it. It came easy. You know, I didn't really study football an awful lot when I was in high school, and I didn't study football when I was at Alabama. And I didn't study football when I was playing pro football. I just went and played. And I was really fortunate to, to play with good players and good teams. I wasn't the only good player on the team. With three national championships in five years, Bryant had created a college football dynasty in Tuscaloosa. Nothing, it seemed, could stop the Crimson Tide. Enter the Associated Press, who, for reasons never fully known, placed Alabama undefeated and dominant in the 1966 season, third behind Notre Dame and Michigan State, neither of which played in a bowl, and both of which owned a record with one tie to the other. And then we go, you know, national champs in 61 and 64 with Joe and 65 with Sloan. And in 66, it's my turn. It's my turn, and we are back-to-back. -back. We're two-time two -time defending champion, back-to-back -back defending champ. And you think that you've probably done all you can do. I mean, you go 11-0. and 0. You go 11-0 and 0 and we beat the hell out of Nebraska in the Sugar Bowl, 34-7. to 7. So we were undefeated going in, win all of our games, we're the only undefeated, untied team, and we end up number three. Uh, no one's ever won it three years in a row, and they weren't about to give it to Alabama. Back then, it's, it's so long ago, it's before cable. You know, it's before CNN, it's before ESPN. It's, it's what are the ranking of their services, UPI and AP. And most of those votes come from the east, some in the west, not as many out of the south. 
And uh, maybe there's a regional bias there somewhere with the voting for that because, you know, the, we were the only undefeated team in the top ten. After six six season, everybody was very disappointed. I think Coach Bryant probably as much, if not more so, than we were because we felt like that uh, when we beat Nebraska that day that there was – no way we wouldn't be national champions, especially as bad as we beat them. One of the greatest, I think, in history for the University of Alabama. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity and the privilege of being associated with the players themselves. Added to the insult of Alabama's snub by the Associated Press was an injury to Stabler's knee. The soon-to-be senior quarterback rebelled when Coach Bryant decreed he'd take time off to recover. Coach Bryant didn't want me to practice. It was in the spring before my senior year. He didn't want me to practice. He wanted me to get my knee well, and I got frustrated with not being able to practice. I enjoyed playing ball, and I enjoyed practice, and I wanted to go. I wanted to be out there playing, and he told me not to. And I got frustrated with not being able to play, not being able to compete, and so I just started running around and hanging out and not going to school and, and taking the, the frustrations out on not doing nothing. We knew what was going on. Um, it was just a, I, it was just a matter of time before Coach Bryant did something about it because we knew he would. Snake was a free spirit, you know, and uh, he got, and, and that's one thing about Coach Bryant. He didn't care who you were. If you broke his rules, uh, you were going to pay. And I got a telegram from Coach Bryant, you know, said you have been indefinitely suspended. Uh, Coach Paul W. Bryant. And I got a telegram the next day from Namath, and it said he means it. He had, he, had, he had suspended Joe, and the, the lesson there, the lesson there, I mean, it's Joe Namath, and then it's me, and it's, you know, the lesson there is, you know, no one player is inexpendable. I mean, you have, it's a team deal. We knew Coach Bryant was, he was going to do what needed to be done. And Snake, and I, and I think we all felt Snake was going to do what he needed to do, too. It took my dad, and it took some local guys here, Dr. Foster, that my mom worked for. They, they, they came up with a letter. They came up with a letter, and it was on, it looked like it was on government letterhead. And it was a fake, bogus letter saying that if I didn't get back into school, basically that I was going to be drafted into the military. My dad went to a local lawyer, he and Dr. Foster, and they designed this letter to look real official to scare me into going back. And the thought of, you know, the thought of, then that registered with me. Maybe I won't get back there. You know, if the military wants, maybe I won't get back there. So I did what was necessary to go get back. You know, get away with something. Not, you know, let other boys. They might try the same thing. I think they can get away with it just like I can. I think it was it was his decision. And I think it was the right one. I was wrong, and and that's why I went I went to summer school to you know get eligible and try to redeem myself. And that's why I'm I'm back out here now. And I had to go and sit down in front of Coach Bryant and tell him that I was now eligible to come back out to the team that I was you know eligible by SEC standards whatever that was and in coach Bryant's office you know that a couch in front of his desk is real low and soft and you sit down in front of him at his desk and you're basically looking up at him you know and he said you don't deserve to be on this team get out of here that's what he said and I said well I'm coming back out anyway and he said we'll see and so I left and then Jimmy Sharp came up to me, I don't know, a couple of days later and said, Coach Bryant said you can come back out for the team and go get your stuff, go get your locker and all that stuff organized. And Coach Bryant said you can come back out for the team. And, and he later told me that the reason Coach Bryant let me is because I didn't take no. I didn't take no for an answer from him. You know, I said, I'm coming back out anyway. And something about that he liked. Coach Bryant said, OK, said he can come back on the team but he is, I'm not going to let him play until I feel like that he served his uh, retribution for his punishment. And I came back after being an all-SEC player. I was MVP in the Sugar Bowl. And I came back to Alabama in my basket when I went back out for practice. I had a brown jersey in my locker. And I was all SEC All-American player, and I had that brown jersey. That's seventh team. I mean, that's as low as you can get. You know, and him calling me that name all the time, you little, you know, all the time. And you had to work your way back up through those jerseys. And he would, he would, he would have not started me the opener come hell or high water. I felt like going into the six or seven season with Snake not starting. I felt though that that he would eventually work himself back in because he came back and he apologized and he worked hard and and he really turned around. And I knew he'd be back in there sooner or later. 
And so we opened up with Florida State, and I had a white jersey. I was a backup quarterback, and Joe Kelly started the game. He gets his kick away to Sumner's side at about the 24-yard line. He moves it out to the 30, gets the run. You know, we're down 14 to nothing against Florida State before everybody got in Legion Field. And we had the number one defense in the country the year before. Coach Bryant decided about right then that Kenny had served his time. It was time for him to come back in. I want F. Ford ready and Steve Davis ready all the time. The second series of the game, he slapped me in the back so hard it almost knocked the breath out of me. He slapped me in the back and he said, go. And I'll go. Go play. Go ahead right now and run the draw. I believe you don't think it'll work right now. Alabama generated 37 points on 287 yards passing, but the defense gave up as many points against FSU as it had in the entire 66 season. The Seminoles tied Alabama, the first time since October of 65 that the Tide hadn't beaten its opponent. And uh, he took us back to Tuscaloosa and tried to kill us because we were, you know, we were number three team in the country. You know, my junior year, finished number three in the country undefeated. And we would come back out, and our opener my, our senior year was a tie, and he, he beat up on us good that week. The reason that uh, we always tried to win the ball game is so we wouldn't have to face Coach Brown on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday the following week because he'd, he'd make it hell on us if we did. He'd, he'd get on the uh, TV on Sunday and say it was all his fault. Monday was a different story. <laughs> The hard work paid immediate dividends as Alabama reeled off wins against Southern Miss and two SEC opponents, Ole Miss and Vanderbilt. The Crimson Tide looked ready for its traditional third Saturday in October matchup against Tennessee. But five interceptions proved too much to overcome the Vols pulling off a 24-13 win. I think if you looked at that team, they, uh, the last five games, after giving up those 37 points, the last five games, that defense only gave up two touchdowns. And uh, we're probably uh, uh, one win away from conference championship. Uh, the Tennessee uh, lost cost us conference championship. It was like, you know, wow, this is awful. You know, we've lost a, a game and tied again. It's not Alabama. Back then, we didn't lose games. The hill was kind of a, it was a hard one to climb, but, we, you know, we'd already been up there, and we didn't want to be knocked off. And so we went to the Auburn game with a lot of motivation to prove ourselves. Nobody expected us to beat Auburn. From day one in high school and my father, you know, you get this Iron Bowl mentality banged into your head as a player, you know, got to beat Auburn, got to beat Auburn, got to beat Auburn, you know, Auburn, Auburn, got to beat Auburn. You know, and that's from eighth grade, ninth grade, I, you hear that. And then when you get up around Coach Bryant and you hear Coach Bryant talk about it, of how important it is, and what it means to you and what it will mean to you in the future. And Coach Brown says you don't you don't have to you don't have to win, but you do have to live with the result. You know, and it's more fun to live with winning than it is to live with losing. And uh, he was saying you need to beat Auburn. You guys need to beat Auburn. You're gonna beat Auburn. Because you're gonna have to deal with it every day of your life. Few rivalries in the country come close to matching the intensity of the one between these two cross-state schools. 1967 promised to be a banner year for the game known as the Iron Bowl. Auburn boasting a squad as talented as any to come from the Plains in a long while, though no one at that time could have predicted that weather would be the biggest story of the game. As I recall, it was a rainy day. I've never seen it rain so hard. and. Uh... We were sitting in the east stands under the new upper deck, so I didn't get all that wet, but we got blown around a bit. I don't recall that it rained the whole morning before. I remember when we got there, we're walking around that it was raining, and then it got worse, and it got worse, and it got worse. It was, uh, it was a mess. I mean, I've never, I have never in my life played in such horrendous conditions. I mean, it rained and rained, and I don't know how many days before the game it rained. The thing about Legion Field, uh, you had high schools that came in there on, and played on Friday nights, and maybe I think they may even have played on Thursday nights, and 
So the field, that field was really, had really gotten a lot of use. And you come in there with a lot of rain. I mean, it was just nothing but a field of mud. When we played a, a game there, particularly in, in December, early December, or late November, the Auburn-Alabama game, uh, what grass was there was sprayed green. It, we made it artificially look good, but really there was no, no grass. Kind of like it looked like a sawdust cover, you know, uh, they would spread sawdust on it and paint it and stripe it, and it was it just terrible. It was like playing just in a cow pasture, the mud three inches, four inches thick, especially after halftime. You know, you would think you'd enjoy playing in a game like that with all the mud. And I, I know as a six, seven-year-old kid, that had been a great thing, you know. But uh, it, it was kind of scary. Uh, I mean, uh, there was, you know, reports of tornadoes around the stadium, hitting around Bessemer and different places, you know, and the rain was just coming down. I think today it probably would have uh, stopped the game uh, and at least let the weather system through before they picked back up. Probably the worst weather conditions that I've ever played in. Of course, I'm, you know, I played a lot of games. I played in some really cold weather in Pittsburgh in playoff games. But as far as field conditions, I mean, the old Legion field was, I don't know, three or four inches of water and sloppy, you know, mud, you know, really bad conditions and rainy, 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 you know. Didn't really matter. I mean, you, they couldn't line up but 11 on the other side of the field anyway. We couldn't line up but 11. So uh, it was just as wet on their side as it was on our side. Auburn made its intentions known with the opening kickoff, almost breaking it for a score until Alabama's Eddie Probst ripped the ball loose. The Tide spent most of the first half backed up against its own end zone. Coach Bryant playing conservatively as the weather and field conditions quickly worsened. The Tigers managed to produce more than 200 yards of offense, though a tough Crimson Tide defense refused to allow them in the end zone. Time and again, Big defensive stops inside the 20 kept Auburn from breaking the game open. Fourth down play here. Body take. Keeps himself. Goes out. And it's Kamoga at the three yard line. Richard Craigie is hit down by Dickie Thompson and Mike Hall. As the second half began, the middle of the field became a quagmire. Players struggled to gain traction and maintain possession of the football. Alabama stuck to its conservative game plan, waiting for Auburn to make a fatal mistake in the kicking game. And the thing I remember most about the game, about the run in the mud game, the Auburn game, was that everything that Coach Bryant said came true. To see the game unfold and the way Coach Bryant played the percentages on it and, and, and kicking on third down uh, when he had the wind at his back and then kicking on fourth down when the wind was his foul, I mean, he, he was a master. You know, he said, we're not going to throw the ball very much because of the, you know, because of the field conditions and the weather conditions. We're not going to throw the ball. We're going to run the ball, run the option, and run off tackle and play for field position. We're going to play for field position. And we'll kick it back and forth, kick it back and forth. And, and then he said, Auburn will screw up the kicking game. That's what he said. Of course, we had planned to throw the ball a little bit more. We were, we were throwing team, uh, you know, uh, uh, back then. But that day, we knew that uh, uh, before the game, Coach Bryant came in and said, hey, you know, we're going to play ball control. And particularly in those days, you played more for field position and not to give a, an opponent, not give the game away by a turnover or making a mistake on the wrong end of the field. So uh, all of that was factored in. We, we didn't gamble as much. And you go back out there and look at the game, you know, the numbers of the game. I threw the ball five times, completed three for maybe 15 yards. We'd run the option, run the option, they'd stop us. Auburn pushed us around most of the day. They, I mean, they, they outplayed us. And they could have scored, if their kicker could have kicked, they could have probably scored two or three more field goals. But he would say, go for it, and all the defense would just celebrate. We were glad that he was going for it. And uh, every time we stopped them when they went for it. Auburn had never crossed our goal line the four years I was here. They had never crossed our goal line. So, you know, my call and those guys really rose up to the occasion. I remember Dickie Thompson threw them for a loss. They were within our 20-yard line a bunch of times down there. That is a defensive victory for everybody. You have to play as a unit. We played as a unit in that game. They were better than us, but, but we won. They had better physical players, I think, in most of the positions. Here's the snap. He goes back. 
Following a mishandled punt attempt, Alabama got its first good field position of the day, starting at the Auburn 46. It was turnovers and field position. And I think finally in the second half, we started moving and getting field position in our playing on their end of the field instead of ours. The Tide picked up five on an option left to Tommy Wade. On second and five, Stabler handed off to his fullback for a yard up the middle. On third and short, with 11.29 remaining, the Tide decided to live or die with the run. The result would become part of Alabama and Iron Bowl legend. Everybody was kind of clenched up, wondering what was going to happen. And Coach Bryant always told us that it was going to be one or two or three or four plays in a ball game that was going to uh, determine the outcome of the ball game. And you just, uh, you have to play hard every play because you don't know what play it's going to be. It was just, we're just going to keep on doing what we're doing and, and we'll win this thing. I mean, we didn't, I guess that was the attitude we had. We didn't think anybody could beat us. I remember that it was an option play, a quarterback option to the right. Uh, to the wide side of the field. I remember on the sideline, uh, uh, Coach Bryant it, it said this, this, this may work, and I looked up and I saw Kenny move to the outside. He'd come out the, down the line on the option play. They were coming up and taking the pitch man, so they were forcing Kenny to run the football. That's a foolish thing for somebody to do, to try to, try to force Kenny Stabler to, to run with the football. And so we run the uh, we run the option, and uh, Dennis Holman gets a great block. And they send the run in the mud thing that Daniel Moore did. The painting it shows Dennis with a great block on the safety. The block that I was called a crackback block. I knew that I had to get that safety. Uh, he was going to be playing up, and he when Snake ran that option coming out to the right, that he was going to come up, either take the pitch man or take Snake. So he took Snake, and I saw him coming, and just uh, fortunately made a good block. I gave him a hard time about it. I said, that's the only block he got all year long was the one he got on run in the mud. And we just kid each other about the play and about the day and guys' re uh, you know, recollections of, you know, the crowd, the weather, the game. I told him that a lot of people up here in my area had, uh, really saw some things wrong with the picture he had done and, and uh, with the run in the mud. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, they really felt like it should have been the block in the mud. You know, and uh, of course we got a big kick out of that, but uh, Snake kids me all the time, only block I ever threw in my career, you know, but it was a good one. Ended up being a good one, and uh, I don't think that block's legal now. <laughs> I don't know, but it used to be what they call a crackback block, but I don't think he can do that anymore. He just turns the, turns the safety inside out, knocks him, you know, knocks him down. I cut behind David Chatwood from here in Fairhope. The end took me and Snake started turning up the field, and I turned up the field. And I cut right behind Dennis, right off of David Chatwood, right behind Dennis's block on the safety, and get to the sideline out there on the, you know, whatever you, where you think the sideline is. I turned up the field and halfway attempted the cornerback and slid around. I got in front of him a little bit, but anyway, uh, I slid about eight or 10 feet in the water. And that sprung him up the sidelines, and then, and then Dennis Dixon, uh, there was a big controversy on a block that Dennis Dixon made on Gusty Year out. But I think if you look at it on film, uh, I think that it would have been hard for Gusty to make the play because he was kind of out of the out of the uh, the angle that he would have had to take. I don't believe he could have gotten there. He's still very adamant about the fact he got held on the play. But you know, hey, it happened and it was over, and you know, nothing you can do about it. On the alleged holding call. Uh, where Dennis Dixon allegedly held Gusty to keep to let Kenny do his run. You, if he'd been holding him, you wouldn't have been able to see it because it was underwater. I don't know whether they held him or not, but uh, uh, they didn't call it. That what does that mean? Uh, I think probably he did, but <laughs> but uh, that one's over with, and it's uh, how do they say it's in the history books? Looked like a good block to me. So uh, of course that's uh, easy for an Alabama man to say. And Dennis denied it at first. But it was over then. I mean, you know, we were seniors and it didn't, it didn't matter. But, uh, yeah, he admitted to it. Whether Gusty could have got there or not, you know, if you look at the film, maybe he could have got out there. I don't know, but, boy, Snake got to that corner so fast. But then, uh, then Stabler, after Stabler got going down the sidelines, there was only one guy that had a chance to get him, and he hit him right at the goal line. I mean, the weather conditions were so bad and so rainy and so sloppy and 
you can't see any markers on the field, so you just get to the sidelines over there where you can use the sideline as an angle for the flag. When I came up, he was halfway to the goal line, and I thought, all right, here we go. And I could see Snake uh, running away, and I, just so, I said, please let him make it. And in the run in the mud, the picture you see me pointing, I've got the ball in the outside arm, and I'm pointing at that safety, somebody get him, somebody block him, and that's to run in the mud, but no, there was nobody to block him, so it was kind of a foot race to the corner. He has a little bit of an angle, I know he's gonna get to me. And then what am I gonna do once he gets to me, you know? Am I gonna just try to run, you know, try to run through that, you know, or try to cut back? You don't have, you don't have a whole hell of a lot of time to think. Usually it's just a reaction that you do. And so I just ran to the corner of the flag as deep as I could to the corner of the flag to keep away from him, that angle that he had coming. And we met about the four or five yard line, I think. And, and uh, because of those old sloppy field conditions, we just kind of, you know, he, he tried to tackle me up high and he kind of grabbed me around the shoulders and we just kind of sloshed in the corner of the end zone. When he scored, pure bedlam broke loose. Uh, everybody forgot that they were soaking wet and uh, their feet weighed about uh, 25 pounds a piece. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was sheer bedlam. I, re I remember getting mobbed on the sidelines by my teammates. I'm um, starting down around the five yard line and walking all over, trying to get back up to the bench after the play. I just remember being mobbed and slapped on the back and slapped on the head and all this. And then the roar of the, the roar of the crowd. Oh, it was fine. I mean, we knew, you know, we knew that we had them then. Uh, I don't even know what quarter we scored. I, you know, I, it was either third or fourth quarter but we knew we had them because our defense was playing great and uh, we just knew that they weren't going to be able to score on us. We felt a whole lot better than we did before Snake scored, I'll tell you that. And uh, we felt like our defense, they had been playing good ball all day and felt like we could hold them, uh, which they did. And uh, we were fortunate to come out on top. Auburn put the ball in the air in a desperation attempt to pull out the win, but two interceptions by Bob Childs stopped the Tigers short. Mercifully, the game reached its muddy conclusion. Alabama with a 7-3 win in an unforgettable chapter of college football's greatest rivalry. You reap the rewards from playing at Alabama for the rest of your life. This is, there's a reward for it. Just so proud to have been a small part of the overall team in four years. Uh, I think we went to the Orange Bowl and the Gator Bowl and the Sugar Bowl and the Cotton Bowl in four years. And I think we lost five games in four years. Being part of history was a great, great thing, and the run in the mud was just part of one of them that was that a lot of us won't ever forget. You know, you played in the worst elements that I've ever played in in my life, and to know that you had a part in helping win that ball game uh, against the other team in the state, you know, was was and is a great feeling. When you see how much fun you get to have with the run in the mud play and all these plays I've been a part of in pro football, you get to have so much fun with that, you know, almost talking about it, reliving my whole career like we're doing right now. You get to you do that all the time and that's part of the reward. And the reason you get that reward is because of what a bunch of other people did. Make it impossible for Harvard to tie with a field goal. So that's why this 
Thank you. 